Um, you know, grits are usually the backbone to a lot of things. Often overlooked as a simple breakfast side. Some lovely, lovely little bit of butter in those grits to make it nice and lush. Grits are more often a critical element in many well-known Southern favorites. I'm Dr. Howard Conyers with the gritty details on grits. Whether it's a South Carolina low country staple like shrimp and grits, fresh shrimp sauteed in butter with onions, tomatoes, and maybe a little wine. Or in Louisiana, grits and griots, which is usually veal or pork medallion and onions smothered in gravy. And then there's couscous, a traditional Louisiana breakfast dish beloved and hated, depending on who you ask. It's basically finer ground grits or cornmeal mixed with hot milk, cooked in bacon grease, and sweetened with cane syrup or fig preserves. Let's get to the granular details with South Carolina miller and farmer Greg Johnson. How you doing, Greg? Good. How are you? I'm glad you could come out. We'll go through the corn process to show the grits and the cornmeal and the brand and all the waste and how everything separates out. Okay, great. Let's go. All right. When you're making grits, I don't need really large stones because I'm not trying to I'm not trying to cut it down. I'm trying to move it through and make it, you know, uniform. This this stone in general means a lot to me. I don't know when it was dated. It's a pretty old stone, but when I was taught to chip stones and when I was taught to mill, the miller that taught me, this is what he taught me on. Every mill has two stones. So a bed stone will hold constant and your runner is turning right against and the, the corn or other grain is coming in through the center and then it's going out of the stone. As the, as the grain comes across the surface, the surface is what's actually cutting it. Ridges and furrows chiseled into stones crack the kernels and serve as channels for mill grits or flour to escape and to dissipate damaging heat produced by the friction of grinding, protecting the grain's nutritional value. You did all that work farming or someone else did all that work bringing that grain. How, how do I bring it to the table or to the chef in the most uh, just 100% natural way possible. We're, we're, we're not inventing a, anything new, we're just using old principles to keep things going. Corn is made up of basic three layers. The brand we want gone, we don't want it at all. And then we're down to the endosperm and the germ. The germ's soft, it's a center. There's only so much I can make, it's almost gonna make cornmeal. The grits most people eat today are usually quick grits, which are very different from grits eaten 100 years ago. For one thing, like most corn-based products, older varieties are more nutritious, higher in protein, nutrients, and less sugar. Today, a lot of people are bringing back old varieties of corn. Dr. Brian Ward specializes in organic farming practices, working with heritage seed varieties. Um, what is this? This is. Sea Island Guinea, Guinea Sea Island, wow. This is some Jimmy Red right here. Things they're talking about is that by the year 2050, we're gonna have to produce twice as much food on half the land with half the resources, you know, and potentially half the water. And so, I mean, uh, trying to do this with sustainable old lines, you know, heirloom lines, land race lines, for breeding, taking uh, genes by cross-pollinating and creating new lines, okay, that, are, that can produce a lot of food, but yet have the genes that are required to do that drought tolerance, disease resistance, insect resistance, things like that, vital work. It has to be done. Since it takes a lot of hard work, is it better to go try to find some old farmer or somebody that has it in the crib somewhere versus trying to back breed it? Uh, just, yeah, it's, it's a lot easier doing that. When a line is near extinction, okay, and it gets contaminated, like it gets cross-pollinated on accident somehow, uh, then you do a thing called back breeding. Once you know the genetics of the original and you know the genetic of what it is now, then you uh, back cross and then isolate the lines and try to maintain that original line. That takes years to do. Finding heirloom varieties takes detective work and even Facebook friends. Well, one of the things I do, I have a sort of famous Facebook page. It's pretty famous. Dr. David Shields is one of many people hunting for old seeds. This is um, Jimmy Red Corn, the uh, seed for this plant right here. And I want you to have it. Oh, thank you. I put a list of the most wanted lost vegetables and grains up. And I put Cox Prolific up. Could this be the same corn? And she said, this is it. So Cox Prolific that is just come to light. That one alone kind of started and was known in, Vir in Virginia and then it was lost. There was a gentleman in the upstate of South Carolina that's 95 years old. His name is Manning Farmer and um, 
1945, he began to grow it, but his dad and his dad's brother started in about 1930, and they bought it out of a seed catalog. So he's been growing it all these years, and we were able to get a handful of seed that we can begin to start uh, getting it here and seeing how it does in our soils. What is your definition of land race? A land race is a variety that has been selected by farmers who base their selection on taste as well as productivity. So it's a farmer improved variety. Now what's interesting about land races is that some of them are extraordinarily ancient and they've come down to us as gifts. The entire wisdom that certain cultures had about flavor are embodied in the plants. They're not in ag books, but the plants themselves are a, a culture's sense of nutrition. Every variety has a story. Every variety has a difference. And um, Jimmy Red is one that we're really focusing on and have focused on. Um, Guinea Flint um, is probably the most interesting uh, southern corn and the one that's planted here. Guinea Flint started, from what I understand, down in Cuba. It went to the south. From the south, it went to Africa and from Africa back to us. So, I mean, these dramatically travel here in this coastal zone of uh, South Carolina and also down in the Gulf Coast, Louisiana, around Mobile, uh, Gulf Coast of Mississippi, there was a bug, uh, a corn weevil. So they had to plant a denser corn. So that's why along these coasts, uh, you find a belt of uh, Sea Island white flint corn or the Guinea flint corn that uh, that Greg uh, grows here in, in Bugby Plantation. These guys aren't just growing older corn, they are returning to old methods for milling them. What, what's so important is, this is where kind of milling starts in, in, in the U.S. The mill itself is called Queen of the South. It's called a post mill because it's got four wood posts, but it's an underrunner. And an underrunner means exactly that, is that the stone on the bottom is turning. The separator, the grit separator, is the oldest known grit separator anywhere. Hardy, coarse ground grits called samp grits used to be common. I've had chefs approach me and say, can you make samp grit? Samp is it's, it's a term for large cut, and I've tried over the years to recreate with other practices to try to make it. Well, we restored this piece of equipment, it took about two and a half years, and when we looked at all the catches, catches meaning where cornmeal and grits fall out, there was one extra catch, and I was like, I don't know what that is, but we'll continue to restore it. And when we ran the first group of corn through it, it made samp grits. Seriously, what's old is new again. The countryside of the South is filled with a lot of old believers who kept... I'm uh, one. Yeah. I'm an old believer. Who kept their family corn, who kept their uh, vegetables, who kept even their turnips, uh, humble vegetables, uh, around because um, they were absolutely perfect for the uses uh, that were intended. You get to hold hands with a generation before, and, and maybe even farther back than that, you get to taste the reason why a group of people or a uh, congregation or a family prized up. You know, look at look at Manning Farmer, 95-year-old man. He's been keeping a variety of corn going since basically he was a child. I mean, that's there's a, you don't you don't do that for just for the fun of it. I mean, there's a reason why he was doing that. So, how do you eat your grits? Please share below. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.